I've wanted to drive a fighter for the longest time. I remember catching one in a magazine article years ago and I fell in love with three things. Its enormous engine, the turbo's potential for over a thousand horsepower and its looks. It looks unlike anything else on the road. Old school but also pleasingly futuristic, all rolled into one pretty exciting package. The Bristol Fighter might be the coolest car you've never heard of. Hell, Bristol might be the coolest car manufacturer you've never heard of. What started as a company making trams and planes ended up making some of the most exclusive cars on the planet. Bristol used to make, amongst other things, aeroplanes, but as they discovered after World War I, if your primary business model requires there to be a war on to thrive, well, when the war stops, you're a little bit stuck. However, the company managed to survive. But during World War II, when it was once again making planes for the war effort, plans were drawn up for an automotive rebirth once the conflict had stopped. Bristol joined forces with Fraser Nash and released the Bristol 400 shortly after the war ended. It was an interesting amalgamation of BMW bits, the plans of which I believe were um, borrowed from uh, BMW's factory in post-war Germany. It had the chassis of a 326, the body of a 327, and the engine from a 328. Bristol did well. Its cars found a number of high-profile fans over the years, and people liked what the company did. However, it being a British firm, it's not without some quirky stories. It's time to introduce you to the former owner of Bristol, Tony Crook, possibly the coolest auto exec Again, you, you've never heard of. Man, Bristol really secretive. Crook was a fascinating man. He was in the RAF during World War II, and then after the war ended, he became a motor racer, a bloody good one at that. He was known to tussle with Sterling Moss. He became a Bristol dealer, and in the 70s, turned his love of Bristol cars not only from selling them, but to owning the entire company. And then he became the kind of auto exec that you and I really love to hope exists. He once paid a hobo to sit on the Rolls-Royce stand during a motor show to put off any prospective clients. He also dressed as a shake and went over to the Fraser Nash stand and pretended to buy all of the products they had. He was fantastic. Crook was also the type to relive his past glories loudly and with self-made sound effects in his office. An odd chap if ever there was one. A choosy guy as well. He famously didn't like the motoring press. The only way into a Bristol was to buy one or become mates with someone who had. If you said something remotely negative about a Bristol, you'd get a letter from Crook himself. They were, according to one source, properly angry, slightly mad, but normally very funny. He was also picky about who he sold cars to. You had to meet his approval before getting in. He once saw film director Michael Winner looking through the window of the Bristol dealership and then marched up to the door and flipped the sign from open to closed. Crook sold half the company in 1997, the other half in 2001 to new owner Tony Silverton. Shortly after that, the fighter was announced. It was set to be all new, all shiny. It was the first new Bristol in years. Apparently at one point the company was saying they were producing 30 a week. That turned out to be not true because I've been chatting with some people who are in the know about these things. One source says there's 14, another says there's 11, yet the common number is 9. 9 have been built and apparently only 4 of them are running possibly but some more might be. Either way, these are incredibly rare. Between 2002 and 2011, when fighter production was suspended, there were three versions of the car. The fighter, this one, a 525 brake horsepower base car. The fighter S, which came with 660 brake horsepower, and the aforementioned 1012 brake horsepower fighter T. The fighter gets its name from the company's past. The original Bristol fighter was a plane. 
I was expecting this to be a cumbersome son of a bitch to drive. I really was, because it looks quite big and it looks quite heavy. But actually, it's, it's easy. The steering is nice and light, though you get a fairly decent slug of feedback from it. And there's quite a bit of weight over the front because, of course, it has an 8-litre V10 engine out of a Viper. Who doesn't like a V10? If you don't like a V10, there's something wrong with you. Just... <laughs> it just tickles nicely. You can leave it in second gear and chunt around town, or even in the countryside, and it won't really make that much of a fuss because it has that much torque. The suspension is, when the road's lovely, it's lovely. Put it like that. When the road gets a bit bumpy, it can be a bit jarring, but then again, this is a handmade British sports car. And this thing is bloody quick. It's got over 500 horsepower, we know that, but the way it puts it on the road, it just, it does it. It does it remarkably well. The doors are awesome, they are gullwing doors. Now, unlike, say, a DeLorean, another car with gullwing doors, there's not just a little strap hanging down that you have to reach for. This has a little grab handle and inertia reel belt on it, and it's wicked. The windows are these little things because, of course, this can't go down into the door because the door opens up. That is one of the downsides of gull wings. But it means if you want to talk to somebody, you have to kind of stick your face out. But because I've got quite a big head, it won't get all the way through the hole. Still, no matter. Once you're in here, admittedly, it does start to show that it was a car developed in the early noughties. It's still remarkably fresh, but it, it's not you know, as we are now, 2015-ish. But it, it looks good, it's all functional, and because the deck back there is made all of glass, there really isn't that much of a visibility issue in this as you would get with other supercars. When you get in, look up and you'll see a hark back to Bristol's aeronautical past. There's switches and buttons that do things like open the fuel fillers and what have you. There's so many cool touches to this car that make you really appreciate where it came from. I can't think of anything to compare the fighter to. Today you'd be looking at the likes of the Merc SL or the Aston DB9 and what have you. But the fighter has a more, how do I put this delicately, hand-built feel to it. This is a hand-built British GT, so I'll leave it to your imagination as to whether anything came off in my hand while I was driving. And I will tell you that no two are entirely alike. The fighter is a wonderful oddity. It's a novel experience to drive, a privilege as well. It makes me wonder what Bristol would have been like had it made more of them, had it been a bigger presence rather than the exclusive club it was in the end. Bristol's fighter was an approach to modernism from a firm that was very much rooted in its own past. It has presence, power, and makes you feel a bit special, even if some of the bits of it are a bit wonky. It's a crying shame more people don't get to enjoy these. However, if they did, would it have been so special? I don't think so. So here's to the fighter, Bristol and Tony Crook, a combination that left the world a bit better off. <laughs> <laughs>